name is McKaylee Lennon, and my husband Scott asked if I could introduce Bill and Amy, two of my closest friends, and I've said, of course I can. I'm thrilled to introduce Bill and Amy. I met Bill and Amy um, in 2003 when I came back from graduate school and started working for the Wildlife Conservation Society in the Adirondack Program. And the Adirondack Program is a direct result of Bill and Amy and their decision to come back from Africa, which you'll hear all about, um, and bring some of those conservation lessons um, and tremendous skill and research to the Adirondacks and to create the North America program of WCS, of which the Adirondacks was a beneficiary and I was able to work there for 15 years. Um, I just wanted to share with you a couple of ways. I won't talk about their work because they're gonna share with you an incredible story um, from African conservation and mountain gorillas, all of which was highly influential here as well. Um, but I do want to just share a couple of ways that they are inspirational to me and continue to be inspirational to me. One is for their scientific approach. Bill and Amy took at the time what was sort of a, a revolutionary approach to a conservation problem in, in Africa by looking at a, at a conservation issue for a particular species and, and looking not just at the ecology of that species and the conservation challenge of trying to save it, but also considering the social and human context of the problem and finding an innovative solution that could benefit both the human and wildlife communities. And that's, that's the model that they then brought here to the North America program of WCS. It's a model that our, my colleague, our colleague Heidi Kretzer and I have tried to emulate in this park for almost 20 years um, with combined social and ecological research to address questions in the Adirondack landscape. So I'm a beneficiary of their tremendous scientific knowledge. But they inspire me in other ways as well. They inspire me as just tremendously kind-hearted and generous people. I learned through a, a random uh, browsing on Facebook one night a, a year or two ago that my cousin turned out to have a lifelong dream of being a, a ranger in Virunga <laughs> National Park. <laughs> I never knew this about him. My cousin Ian lives in Ohio. I don't get to see him anywhere near as often as I would like to, but as soon as I saw a post that he had put up, I think he was trying to raise money for Barunga, I said, you gotta read it, Bill and Amy's book. <laughs> and I called them up and I said, can I send you a book and could you sign it for Ian and then could you send it to him in Ohio or send it back to me and I'll send it, up? all of which they did happily um, and, and quickly. And Ian got to get uh, not only a great book, but one that was signed by um, Bill and Amy and, and I felt so proud to be able to say that I, I knew people that had been um, so important in a, in a region that he just happened to care about too, a guy in, in Ohio, <laughs> all of his life. Um, and the last one I'll, I'll share is more on the personal side. I don't know if you even know this, but Bill and Amy inspired me tremendously, not just as scientists and as, as kind people, but as parents. <laughs> you were among the first people to ever learn, not long after I did, when I became pregnant with our first child. Um, we were at your house in Johnsburg and I remember telling you about it. And if you've spent any time with them, you know right away that their sons are just the center of their lives and they somehow always have found a way in the midst of all of the important scientific work that they do to also be there for every part of, of their boys lives and be tremendously supportive. I remember being at your house in Yorktown when we were all going to a meeting at the zoo the next morning. They had us overnight and we were pilfering your kitchen in the morning and, and you said, if you're looking for cereal and bowls, they're in the really low cabinet down at ground level. We put them there when Noah and Ethan were, were tiny kids so that they didn't wake us up in the morning. We could get their own breakfast and we just left them for since that time. Um, and I reflect on that now thinking about the fact that my kids are 13 and 15 and, and Scott and I are not that far out <laughs> from also having the empty nest and the cereal in the same place it's always been <laughs> reminding us of our kids. Um, I'm thankful that when Bill and Amy left Africa, they came here um, and started the North America program. I'm thankful that when their time at WCS came to an end, they chose to make the Adirondacks their permanent home. I'm thankful that one of their sons, Noah, has also done the same. He's got a farm uh, over in Essex in the Champlain. Um, and I'm tremendously thankful that they're here today and that my kids get to have the opportunity to be inspired by them the same way that I have always been. Please join me in welcoming Bill O'Brien any better. Wow. 
Kayla, Scott, both of you, thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure for us to be here. And first, I want to thank all of you for giving up part of a gorgeous day. Um, it's a day, I hope you were able to get out either this morning or we'll go out this afternoon, but um, Adirondacks is a fantastic place to live and work and play and why we're so happy to be back here um, as our permanent home. Um, and I know you've given that up today to come here, so to sit in a dark room. Oops. So let me make sure I've got things organized. Um, anyway. Great thanks, um, and thanks to be able to share the story with people who, um, who care so much about this place as well. It, it, it's not working. Here. It seems a world away, and in many ways it is. Um, the, these mountains of East Central Africa, um, uh, species like gorillas, um, we have nothing quite like that here, obviously. Um, but I actually think that the stories that we tell that are, are founded on some very, very strong common ground, and that's this wonder of life um, and the richness of life all around us and the nature that it gives us and provides us with so much. Um, and so far away as it may seem, um, I, I hope our stories um, are, are relevant to you in, in some other deep ways. Um, and I'm gonna start with our stories not quite a birth, but almost oh, no. Um, Bill and I both grew up in central New York. Um, I grew up in Palatine Ridge or Canada to Harry, uh, and I spent all my summers in the Adirondacks. We had a family cabin. And so for me, I, one of the things I treasure in that background is being able to be out as a free, free child in nature. Um, it was a very tame, wild nature, but it was nature nonetheless, and it really was important to me. Um, Bill grew up in, in Watertown and Sk Skinny Atlas, so other sides of the park. Um, his family visited the Adirondacks. His wildest memories are of watching bears at garbage dumps here, here in the Adirondacks. So, um, you know, we have this in our blood. We have it in our history um, as individuals as well. We met many years later, um, but in college, still as very young adults. Um, and found common interests and common ground in many ways. Um, but it's been since that time that we have traveled together, well, got married, traveled together, worked together, raised a family together. Thank you, Ms. Kaylee, for your comments on that. And we still keep the celery or the cereal down in the bottom, and we have to get on our knees practically to get it out of the cupboard. Um, uh, raised a family together, we've aged together. Um, we have really enjoyed this life of being able to intertwine our personal and our professional lives as we go. So, uh, one of the, as we think back, one of the key experiences, one of the key moments, sets of moments in our lives were as Peace Corps volunteers. As we left college, we didn't get into the same kind of advanced schooling, and so we said, let's go across the world. And we went as very naive, um, young Americans in the Peace Corps. We taught high school in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, what was known as Zaire back then. Um, but it allowed us to live in a small village for a good portion of that time and sort of understand a bit better <clears throat> what life in an African village was like. Uh, we also had this amazing opportunity to go and during our free time go visit parks, national parks, mostly in Kenya and Tanzania. And there, we got to see this amazing diversity and continued existence of all those animals that I had read about in my ABC books, from art dogs to zebras, um, these big mammals in a place that was still so tremendously wild um, and wonderful and raised all sorts of questions in my mind. But at the same time, we also saw people in tremendous poverty, people who were, who were lacking some of the basic resources in their lives, water, food, um, any kind of security, um, and, and really separated from the parks that we were visiting and disconnected from that and from what became a real interest of ours, conservation over time. And it was because of those experiences that we really entered our world of conservation, trying to merge those two things, as Mick Haley said, and that became really, really important to us in our careers. We also had the chance to visit um, a park while we were there in eastern DR Congo, um, Kabuzi Diege, and we saw glimpses of 
mountain gorillas. That is not one of the pictures we took at that time. Um, we really saw fleeting glimpses in the bushes and in the trees. But it was enough to give us an idea of what, here there's a need, here there's so little known, here is something that where maybe we could contribute in some way. And we were inspired. We were inspired by that. What we ended up doing in our graduate studies was, in fact, going to Rwanda um, over the border from, from Congo. Um, and because there was a research center there, there were possibilities there um, to actually be able to build knowledge as well as to build conservation programs. Rwanda, as you see on the right here, it's a very small country, just to give you a little background. Um, it's actually about the size of the Adirondack State Park, um, tucked in there between other countries, as you see. It um, actually has the oldest national park in Africa. It was um, declared in 1926, the Volcanoes or Virunga National Park, depending on which side of the border you're on. And it actually has national parks on uh, the sides of, of, well, including these three countries, Uganda, Congo, and Rwanda, though our work was um, almost entirely in Rwanda. It's a stunning place. It's a little hard to see in this photo, um, but these are old, ancient volcanoes. Um, Virunga in Swahili means volcano, so I use inter interchange those words. Um, this is where the tectonic plates in Africa are ripping apart very slowly. We imagine someday, long, long, long in the future, there may be a sea coast here. <laughs> but as it does, it, these, the magma would come up through weak points in the Earth's crust, and so you have this um, set of volcanoes right smack dab in the middle of eastern um, uh, Central Africa. Um, these rise to um, almost 15,000 feet in altitude, so high elevation um, mountainous area. Now, any kind of work, any science that either, or certainly that I was doing, is based on the work of other people who precede us. And George Schaller is that iconic field scientist um, in whose footsteps I followed, and I'm really proud to have followed in his footsteps. His PhD work was actually on the ecology and behavior of mountain gorillas over on the Congo side. Um, and so it's amazing to this day how much of what he observed back in the 19, early 1960s um, is still the bedrock foundation of our understanding of mountain gorillas. Added to that, more recently in the 70s, you have the work of Diane Fossey, who you may have heard of, um, and she really brought gorillas um, to public attention. And her work was almost entirely on the behavior of mountain gorillas, and she started long-term following studies year after year after year that continue to date, um, though she is um, long gone. Um, and so her work has been extremely important as well. And what we knew as we walked into the situation was gorillas live in stable families. Um, the families at that time ranged up to uh, almost 30, 35 individuals. When we got started, the biggest group was 15. But regardless, stable families. Um, and they're stable in that they live, they grow up in these family groups. You've got a male on the left, adult male, we call him a silverback, because he does turn silver around his back. Um, a group of females and their offspring. Um, and um, you know, it is a, a, a very social grouping. Uh, living together, but in terms of stability, they live together for years and years. It is really a family grouping. And in any of those family groupings, you could have anywhere from one to four silverbacks, adult males, um, a whole number of females. Um, but in terms of the silverbacks, they just imagine 400 pounds, maybe 450 pounds of muscle in front of you. Um, they're really um, impressive creatures. And they just seem to exude power. They defend their families. You know, they are not King Kong. They don't attack an, unless um, feeling this need to defend. Um, but once in a while, they do get up on their, on their feet um, and beat their chest um, in order to defend. And if you want to ask anything more about the personal experiences with defense, ask Bill. Um, I'll let him tell that story. Again, the family would have multiple females. Um, these really are the animals that are the glue in the family. They're often related to each other. Um, they stay, silverbacks may come and go as they contend for power um, in a family. 
And what was remarkable about our going to the research center we went to, which had been founded by Diane Fossey, was we were go walking into families where the history of any individual less than 15 years old was known. We knew their birthdays, we knew who they were related to. Um, we actually knew something about their personalities, which differed quite a bit from one to another. Um, it was an incredible um, situation to be able to walk into. And the lives of these little guys growing up, who they related to, in what ways, um, is something that is fascinating. I'm not going to touch on it. Um, my work was somewhat different. Um, but this is well known. And some of this was being um, brought to American living rooms through National Geographic television shows as well. Um, so they stay animals, stay in its family until it's becoming, and through its adolescence, it's becoming mature, and then both, uh, well, males all, almost always, and females sometimes will leave their birth group. Um, and that's to avoid inbreeding, obviously. Um, so it was interesting to know at what point, how, where animals would transfer. But all of this added up to a pretty well-known life history, or putting together the chronology and biology of critters over time, individuals over time. And as a result, we knew a lot about family life, um, very close social bonds, who, who was more affiliated with whom, who bickered with whom. I mean, these were, in some ways, um, reflecting what we see in our own families as well. Although my children are perfect, it's true. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, you know, here you see, actually, I don't know, I guess it was in the one before. You know, there's, there's six or seven individuals in that group. That's how tightly packed they are. Now, they're not always that tightly packed, um, but at midday, you know, they kick back and um, relax and groom each other and, and do other things. Um, anyway, great situation to walk into. Um, so what we knew was, you know, here are these gentle giants, not really King Kong, really not King Kong, gentle giants living in, in um, closely knit family groups. Um, intelligent, curious, um, all of that was clear as soon as you walk in and begin to observe um, these animals. They share 98% of our genetic material. Um, they are among our very closest kin living on this earth. That makes them fascinating in so many different ways. For me, one of those things was I felt in some way I could s somewhat see the world through their eyes because they're so similar to us. Um, it pulled me into the world of nature in a way that I had not expected. And not just as a scientist, but as a sort of admiring relative in their midst. Um, we knew that it wasn't all sweetness and light, however. We knew that there were some real problems of illegal hunting. Um, this was not a, 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 a high volume activity. It didn't happen all that frequently. But gorillas were being killed illegally. They were protected by law as well as protected in the park. Um, and they were killed at that time for the skull that was being sold, to, in some cases, to a museum in Europe um, for various kinds of souvenirs. Um, and sometimes, um, if a young animal was captured as considered to be something that could be sold as a pet um, or potentially to a zoo, um, all of this was underground. Um, it was all illegal. Um, but it was a real concern. It wasn't happening that often, but it was enough to, to be very worried about. But what we realized was far more ominous was what was happening to their habitat, what was happening to this, this wild national park um, where they lived. And it's hard to see, but all of the flat land you see in this picture is farmland. And part of that had been lost in just the last couple decades. Um, so really, the gorillas were living up on these mountain slopes, and that was their home, and it was very restrictive. This is a different view of what had been lost. Those areas that are sort of striped was part of the national park and had been lost over a decade or two. Um, a government decision. We're going to take this land, it's good agricultural land, and grow some cash crops and allow people to feed themselves better. But as a result, we also knew that the population of gorillas had crashed over that same period of time after the loss of that habitat, from a George Schaller's estimate about 450 down to 275. Um, and at that point, scientific articles, a few, were coming out saying, 
there's not enough habitat left, there's not enough resources left, this population is going to go extinct. There's no way they can survive at, you know, 275 as it continues to crash. Um, that's also what, what the backdrop for our work was at that time. And that's the population for the whole. Oh yeah, um, it's the, it, the map is of the Rwanda side of the park, but the population is of the whole three country area, the Virunga Massif, the Virunga Mountains. So this is another view, same place. This is a satellite image, um, and this shows you how small, how mountaintop were restricted, and how completely isolated this forest, which is in the dark green, is from the land around it, which is all intensively used by small-scale farmers. Um, there, there's no buffer. It's a completely sharp edge to where they can live and where there aren't resources for them to live. So our concern at that point as we entered was here's this tremendously alluring creature, um, something that we, so many of us can relate to. We knew it was highly endangered. There only, we thought that was the only population of mountain gorillas in the world. It turns out there's another, but it's smaller than this one. So highly endangered, um, without much prospect for the future, um, according to the literature. Um, simply not enough resources that was assumed, and it was assumed they'd go extinct. But, you know, Bill and I, having been in the region and knowing a little bit more about history and a little bit more about how people were relating, how governments worked or didn't work, we had some huge questions in our mind as to whether that was really an unavoidable uh, outcome. And so we decided we'd go into what we could to try to improve the information base and see what could be done if it made sense. So as graduate students, we moved from Madison, Wisconsin to the right side of that little patch in the meadow at the base of Mount Vesoki in the park. And we were so incredibly fortunate to live in the park um, for 18 months. I still feel that tremendous fortunate uh, sense of living in the Adirondack Park, very different but um, here we are surrounded by nature and I love it. Um, we worked at the Karasuki Research Center, as I said, it had been founded by Diane Fossey, and we had some known history of animals. Um, that was a big help. Uh, but what we didn't know, what we needed to do, and the first thing Bill did was go out and say, is this correct population crash continuing? Um, uh, was there still a decline, and to what degree, and it, was it really um, irresolvable? So he went out from mountain to mountain about 72 days in a row, sweeping from west to east. It was the first time a complete census like this had been done of mountain gorillas, all in, in a, a, a strict chronology um, to give the most accurate view possible of the number of gorillas. Uh, he did it with a great team of people. That's Nameni Claver, um, with a cigarette hanging from his mouth. He's one of the intrepid um, fellows that we worked with um, and made this possible. And Sabino on the bottom is uh, a mountain that means the teeth of the old one, and you can see why. It took Bill and his teams 26 days just to do Sabino, going up and down the, the ridges and looking for gorilla sign, gorilla trail. And you can imagine, you know, how does one do science? How does one even do a count? Um, most scientists are left taking some samples and trying to extrapolate that from that. Um, we were able, Bill was able to actually go out and try to do an ex exact count. And you don't count individual gorillas because they don't let you see them all. So what you do count is their nests. Every night they make a night nest if they're three years old or older approximately. And the really fun part is that you get in and you look at the dung and you measure the dung. <laughs> and that, the size of the dung tells you the age, the age group that that individual um, could be classified as. So we can get an idea of, of pretty accurately of ages as well as numbers of individuals. It's a really amazing technique. Uh, it seems crude, and it was, but it really works. Um, so. And infants. Uh, and infants, if you, if you had a, a nest um, with really small dung in it, or smaller dung, you know it was a mother with infant. Um, infants less than six years, six months old, don't leave dung. And so you could extrapolate what, what um, that might look like if you had an age structure film. And a bit more science. Um, this is what he found. Um, it was a continued decline from 275 to 262. Could have missed a few, but it was, it was not good news in that sense. 
Um, but it was nowhere near the same rate that we had seen earlier. What was the good news in this work was as we did demographic analysis and said, okay, given the ages and all of that, turns out that a large proportion of the individuals were under 15 years old or under 12 actually, pre-reproductive. So in other words, if they could survive and they could reproduce, you had this great potential for the population to come back. They were not, as Robert Arfrey had said, avoiding reproduction and shuffling off the stage of, of life into extinction. No, they were, they were doing what they needed to do <laughs> to try to assure their population. So my job was then to spend the 18 months trying to looking at what do they do? Where, what resources do they need? What do they eat? How much do they eat? Where do they travel? Um, are those resources sufficient enough to allow the population to be sustained, but better yet grow? Um, because we didn't have, that was the, those were the gaping holes in our understanding of gorillas. We knew so much more about their behavior than we did about their basic requirements. And so that was my job. It amazes me that I could walk in and within a couple months, sit down and stay and follow an animal just a yard away. Scientists also don't usually have that opportunity. It's it's very, very rare. A lot of times you're dealing with sign left behind or you're, you're sifting dung to see what they ate. I could watch it happen. These gorillas were tremendously kind. Um, and I was interested again in what they're eating. Um, that's a silverback on the right eating a rare food, um, bark. Um, and then look at where were their food resources located, where in this park, and, and again, were there enough of them? I needed to look at both foods and habitat. Um, and just you know, consider that basic fundamental ecology. Um, were the resources sufficient? I turned to the trackers and guides who I worked with and who taught me so many things and were tremendously patient and kind with me. And the most outstanding was Rilla Kana Emmanuel. And I just want to give him credit for everything I was able to do and learn. So I spent about 18 months doing this, I spent either full mornings or full afternoons. I ended up spending about 2,000, more than 2,000 hours total in sight of gorillas. And again, it's just an incredible opportunity for a scientist. Uh, I could see exactly what they were eating. I could see, I could simulate how much they were eating. I could see what they didn't eat, that they didn't prefer or didn't want. Um, I could see how far they traveled. Um, I could see them fight over foods. Um, it was really great. Um, and then again, it's just an opportunity that a lot of science cannot do that kind of, the kind of analysis I was able to do. One of the things I was trying to do again was to, how much do they eat, um, how much of each kind of food type. Um, and here I am trying to simulate handfuls of gallium, ladies' bed straw. We have a, a different species of it here in our own forest. Um, and trying to simulate handfuls, Beethoven's in the back, we did name them, um, eating, and I'm trying to simulate, okay, there's one, there's another. And the one thing you can't do, I also did nutritional analyses to see what was it in these foods that might be driving your choices to eat or not eat. Um, one thing you can't do is take what they ate and do a nutritional analysis on it because it's gone. And so you're doing the best you can and making the assumption that this is good enough Beethoven could have eaten this if he had wanted to. Um, and then, you know, I would do nutritional analyses and all. Well, this day, and I, I would do this for a couple animals for a full day. It was exhausting work, um, but I thought it was really important. That day, Beethoven came over, he grabbed my bag, and he ate the whole darn thing. <laughs> um, the good news is, I guess I was making reasonably decent choices <laughs> about foods. And the bad news, again, I had to go do it again. But it was very reaffirming um, for the work I was doing. Um, basically, uh, what I found out was, um, out with those 2,000 hours spent with the gorillas, um, I saw them eating 130 different foods, which was almost, well, it was at least five times more than anybody had observed before, so a much higher diversity of foods. Um, they were eating, as, by my estimate, 20 to 40 pounds of food a day. So that's a lot. There's a little bit of gourmet and a little bit, a lot of gourmand in these animals. How much do you figure you eat per day? How many pounds? Shout it out. Two. Two? Too many. Somebody said ten. 
The average is considered in the American household two to four. 20 to 40 pounds. Um, that's why they have such large um, bellies. Um, they're trying to digest this massive amount of food. And what they're eating is almost entirely vegetation. They are vegetarians. Um, so they don't have the higher quality food that we eat in terms of meat, um, if you do eat meat, or selecting proteins in your plant food. But what they do do as vegetarians is they are very selective. Um, they do select well out of um, random uh, patterns. They highly select and prefer high proteinaceous foods. I can tell that after the analyses I had done. Um, they also selected very rare foods. So if you're thinking about being a vegetarian and trying to balance all these different needs for vitamins, minerals, and amino acids, you need a variety of foods to make sure that you cover all those bases. Gorillas are doing that. They're doing that. They've been involved to do that. Um, and you see one eating bamboo shoots in the top, another eating the, the skin, basically the epidermis of the vine. They ate blueberries and blackberries, um, but there just weren't very many in their, in their environment. There are almost no fruits at all. So I don't think they could survive in the Adirondacks, but they have a few foods they might choose. <laughs> Um, in the middle of the day, they didn't eat. They would rest, and for me, it was a great time to just take a break, um, let, take down my scientific filters, and have this wonderful opportunity to just be and exist um, alongside them. And I have to say, it was great. It rejuvenated me for an afternoon of data collection. Um, it entertained me as the little kids would play king on the mountain, or wrestle, and I as asked later, you know, do they play like human children? And I had to add, answer at that time, I don't know, I haven't had any children of my own yet, and I was never a babysitter. Um, but they do, now that I've had my own, they do play an awful lot like human, human kids. Um, and that can be a challenge to a scientist, you know, our, the policy at the camp was don't respond to anything they do. So if they came up to me, um, I didn't respond, and so I could just watch, which was wonderful. Um, but you have to wonder, how, you don't want to influence their behavior. Um, and that was truly tested by Pablo. Pablo was about four years old um, when I was visiting his group, his family daily. And Pablo's mother left the group. Um, she transferred to another family of gorillas, which happens. Um, he, was, he didn't go with her, and he could have probably, but he stayed with his birth family. And here he was for the first time without his mom to sleep next to, um, to defend him in any kind of bickering in the family. Um, and I wondered and worried a little bit about Pablo's fate. He, in the first heavy rainfall, he came over to me and he sat smack dab by my side and he worked his head under my arm. And I realized I was sitting there like Liza, protecting him from the rain and my heart going out to this little guy and thinking, this is, this is an unparalleled experience. I am so lucky. And then also realizing that I couldn't take her place. I shouldn't be interacting with him like a gorilla. Um, I would go home at night. I would leave at some point. This is sort of, in some ways, ethically wrong. And so from that point, and it wasn't just the science. It wasn't, I must be far away. It, it was that ethical um, drive for me. And so the next time, I gently pushed him away. And as he would pester me, sometimes I'd give him a really hard pinch underneath so that nobody else knew that's what I was doing. Um, and I, I still worried about him a little bit. Um, unexpectedly, we had never seen this before, he started hanging out with his father, who usually didn't tolerate the kids in the family. Um, he started sleeping next to Beethoven, his father. Um, he was more protected by Beethoven than I've ever seen a male protect a youngster. Um, and he turned out okay. I think Bill will tell you a little bit more about Pablo. Uh, but those are the kinds of things that go through, you know, you don't know. You don't know the impact of what you're doing. Um, you try to minimize it. It's hard in a family like this to be separate because you've been invited in. Um, so there's some pretty big questions you ask yourself while you're doing this because you're a scientist but you're also a person. Um, anyway, all of that, back to the question of science and home range and foods. This is a great place for gorillas to live. Lots of herbaceous vegetation, which is what they love to eat, on the ground. Very open forest, so lots of vegetation growing on the ground. This is prime habitat. 
If you look at it in this sense, these are the three parts in the three countries, Rwanda being on the southern flank. Um, that prime habitat is the white zone, the woodland herbaceous zone. And the dots represent where Bill and his teams found gorillas. And as we combine my information with his information, we realize there's some big areas of great habitat that were not occupied by gorillas. So both given what I was seeing in terms of food choice and lots of those foods avail available within the range where they were working, and then looking at the habitat types generally and that there was habitat unoccupied that seemed to be really good for gorillas, that gave us so much more hope, just adding that information to the picture. Um, and so my work led me and us to feel like the gorillas were actually in really good ecological shape, ecological position. They had enough foods, they could create, they could choose a variety of foods. They were traveling in space basically un, um, unaffected within the park um, in terms of resources and all. Um, they were reproducing, so it really made it so much more important to look at what was happening outside of the park. And that's Bill's story, I leave it to him, and thank you. If I start to list, it's because my left leg is asleep. I'll try and hold off. Can you all hear me okay? Great. This is the clicker. Yeah, so here's the habitat outside the, the volcanoes. Uh, Amy started off with a story of us in Peace Corps being able to go out and visit parks in East Africa where we see these just amazing wildlife spectacles, phenomenal habitats, but when you went outside the park, the grass that was green often turned brown, the river that was flowing many times stopped running or was much less productive. And so we certainly uh, were impressed with the fact that these areas needed to be protected, they were great treasures, but also that living next to these parks um, could be a handicap for people, and many of those people were quite poor. Others, maybe they weren't that poor, but they were, they had limited, very limited access to these parks because of the rules of those parks. And it wasn't just East Africa, although poverty was probably greater there. This was the case in the United States, this was the case around the world, where parks at that time were seen as, you know, let's draw a line, it's a fort, stay out, we'll find you, might even shoot you. Um, and that's how parks were. And, you know, you come to, uh, and, and so we decided we were going to move forward working in conservation, but try and bring attention to the fact that people, especially the local people, had to be part of the conservation equation. And as we left Africa and started looking at grad schools, it became pretty obvious that that was not a very important question um, for most people. There were no grad schools uh, that I could find anywhere that would let me pursue a doctorate looking at local people's interests. Which I find kind of funny since we teach half the year at Yale, uh, what was the forestry school, now the school of the environment, and 90% of our grad students all want to work on human aspects of, of conservation. But it was uncommon, and it was important and needed attention. If you look here at the habitat in Rwanda, it certainly looks greener than what Amy showed from, uh, from that was probably Kenya in that picture, yeah. What in Kenya? But um, the habitat's greener, but there's still a lot of problems, and there's a lot of poverty. And the people around the park were not getting attention from the research station that was there. They weren't getting attention from the park authorities, the Belgian foreign advisors, from their own government. They're just, well, they're there, and either you ignore them or you treat them as a problem. So that was part of what we wanted to look at, and that became a major part of my work there. Um, you know, let me show you where the park is in northwestern Rwanda. Rwanda is almost completely occupied, and it's occupied at one of the highest human population densities in Africa at that time, and still to this day, with parks in the northwest, southwest, and on the east. Um, but the rest of it, very much occupied, and as densely occupied as almost anywhere was around the Volcanoes Park. And Amy talked about, showed you a scene across the valley, saying that that area had been cleared um, quite recently, about 10 years before we got there. And what it was cleared for um, was, and you can see the lines, straight lines, Rwandans were not settled in straight lines, but this was a European fund development 
project, so they're nice straight lines. And what it was cleared for was this crop, pyrethrum. And at the time, DDT had been banned in the US and Europe uh, as an insecticide because of its toxic side effects. And so the world was looking for a more natural alternative. And pyrethrum is the source of pyrethrin, which is still out there in a lot of insecticides. It's much less toxic. It's a good product. But in this case, 40% of the mountain gorilla habitat in Rwanda was taken so that they could grow this as an export crop to sell to us in the United States or others in Europe. Looking outside the park, um, this is an area right across the major valley, lava valley from, from the park. Incredibly steep slopes, up some of the, the highest mountains outside of the park. And people were moving up to settle that area at a very rapid pace and remarkable control. I mean, really hard work to, to settle, to, to farm in that area, but still really exposing themselves to a lot of problems, particularly erosion. And the reasons were pretty clear from some of my early general work, which was just for one, it did have the highest population density of a non-island country in Africa. 95% of the people, like this woman in the upper right, were subsistence farmers who lived off of what they could grow on small plots of land, often barely more than an acre. It had the highest population growth rate at the time. Again, this is late 70s. And it was rated one of the three poorest countries in the world. So they had a lot going against them and it put a lot of pressure on the land. So part of my research was to try and figure out how people looked at these the, the issues of their needs and also their relationship with the park and wildlife. And a lot of times in research people, particularly for conservation I've noticed, people go and start asking questions right away, well what do you think about living with elephants, what do you think about this? And I felt, and I'm glad I felt this way at the time, that it'd be good to start off by just asking them. How do you look at the world? What's important to you? What are key issues for you, your family, your community? And this is what came back. Nothing about gorillas, nothing about elephants, not problems, not benefits. Just we need land, we suffer from poverty, we need jobs, and the water is a critical issue. Because although it rained a lot up there, two meters, seven feet a year, um, because of the lava soils, very porous soils, the water just went straight underground. Things related to conservation, it was clear that most of their attitudes, you know, were more about use. Yet yeah, trees are okay if I can cut them down and use them for firewood. Um, I get water, sometimes I hunt a little bit. Um, surprisingly, although, you know, Amy showed pictures of gorillas being killed, none of those are being killed for consumption by Rwandans. This was all for a foreign market, particularly European market. Some French doctors were caught with several skulls in their, their house near the park. Um, so, surprising, and Diane Fossey didn't think much of local people, she sort of saw them as all threats. But most of them thought the gorillas should be protected. They really didn't see them as a problem, they didn't raise the crops. But at the same time, a slight majority said, well, we should open the park for agriculture. Clearly, you can't protect the gorillas if you're gonna open the park for agriculture. So that was an issue that had to be dealt with. But it was a really good one for us to know. And pretty quickly, things got put to a test from my research and Amy's research when the government with the European Development Fund came up with another project to clear another 30% of the park to put in 5,000 head of cattle with an annual expected estimated rate of return of $70,000, not a whole lot. We thought, you know, there's got to be a better alternative than another development project here. That also would have been a lot of the prime gorilla habitat. So that's when you take off your rain gear, take off your muddy boots, put on a coat and tie, and start dealing with authorities because that's where a decision's going to be made. The government was already talking to the European Development Fund, what are we going to do? What we came up with was the Mountain Gorilla Project, multifaceted effort. One, uh, the part we did not work with directly was uh, park security. It was needed, gorillas were being killed, but guards did not need, this is what we found when we got there, they did not need these old, practically Civil War muskets or the kind of uniforms they got. They really needed good rain gear, um, impermeable boots, tents, radios to communicate out in the forest. And so that was an effort uh, that was undertaken. I started working with an education project going around the schools, just showing, talking about gorillas, talking about conservation issues, the watershed values of the volcanoes. Um, 
interestingly, you know, I thought we should do the more practical things in the talk and make sure we talk about water and talk about potential jobs for maybe tourism, which didn't exist at the time. But people were mostly interested in hearing about gorillas. They were just fascinated by gorilla behavior, a nine month gestation period for females, how long do they nurse, how many kids do they have, oh, polygamous structures. My grandparents had polygamous families, all of that. So that was kind of an interesting discovery. And that was quickly taken over, um, passed on to a really good team of young Rwandans. What I focused on mostly was tourism. And we felt this, it didn't exist barely existed at the time, and he had a star performer in terms of, of the gorilla, and it did act like King Kong sometimes. But what we ran into here was this perception throughout the Rwandan Park Service that African tourism is this. You get in your Land Rover or your Zebra Stripe minibus, you drive out, you see elephants, zebras, giraffes, all of that, leopards and lions, preferably in front of Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, you go back to your lodge at night, have a gin and tonic, go out the next morning. And we were talking about a very different kind of tourism where you went out and got walked through nettles and the mud. These are actually some of our Yale students, but mud's been the same ever since we started. <laughs> um, there, are no there are no roads in this park. There are really no trails. You follow mostly elephant and Cape Buffalo trails which adds its own level of excitement. And you get really dirty, and you get stung by nettles while you're there. But it worked, and what we were able to do is come up with a, a protocol for tourism that limited the numbers of visitors to eight people for one hour for any one guerrilla group. At the beginning, we had two groups that we started habituating. I think the latest I've heard is that 10 out of over 40 guerrilla groups in the three countries are now habituated for tourism. Purposes and keeping that seven meter distance, which is really important, but also a real challenge for the young gorillas um, who want to come up to people. The effect of it, well, the year before we started this project, they made a whopping $7,000 a year. That's not enough to maintain a vehicle, let alone buy one. Um, Ten years later, we had close to 7,000 visitors, bringing in over a million dollars in direct revenue and probably four to five million dollars in other monies that were spent around the park and in the capital city. And a really important change was that the farmers that I had surveyed in the late 70s, by the mid 80s, were much more positively disposed toward the park and really seeing that this was a benefit to them and that the park should be protected. That was really important. But the bottom line isn't, are you making money? It isn't our local people happy if you're working in conservation. It's how are your critters doing? How's the protected area doing? And here the news was really great. My census in 1978 was the all-time low point. I'm not proud of that, but that's what it was. And it showed that over the first 10 years of the Mountain Gorilla Project, those numbers started going up slowly, then a little bit more. By the time we were ready to leave in 1989, uh, numbers were up significantly, not to showers levels, but at 320, and we again were seeing a higher percentage. I think it was the first time that the percentage of infants had um, gone over 50%, those over six to seven years old. So that was really great news. We were offered jobs to run the Africa program for the Wildlife Conservation Society back in New York. Our sons were seven and three. Um, it was great to grow up in a rainforest, but naked, but it, sometimes, but it was also nice to get back to school. Um, and again, it was also nice to get a paid job. And so we took our jobs with the Wildlife Conservation Society, went back to New York thinking, you know, things are going really well here. And then Rwanda went to hell. As many of you may know, in the early 90s, a, a civil war started along pretty much ethnic lines, class lines. And by 1994, that had escalated, and in a 100-year period, 100-day period, close to a million Rwandans were killed in a, in a genocidal fit of madness. Um, parks were invaded, although very little impacts on the parks occurred. But the impacts were really on the people of Rwanda. We lost a number of friends and colleagues in that time, and it was pretty hard to imagine ever going back there. Amy went back nine months after the genocide ended, I think she had ten or twelve thousand dollars stuffed in her boots to see who was alive, what could be done, 
how can you help? And over the next 10 years, WCS and some other groups did their best to put private funds into Rwanda for conservation. But it was really a, just a holding action. The, the country was preoccupied with dealing with the trauma of the recently ended the genocide, starting reconciliation, and also starting to think about economic recovery. You know, it's one thing to let's all say we can get along, but it's, you got to have jobs, you got to have something that keeps the economy going. And on one of our trips in the early 2000s, they said, you know, if we can't, the key to our economy is going to have to be getting uh, tourism back up and running. We don't have minerals, we don't have other things except subsistence farming. Um, we've got to get that going, would you help? And we worked with a team of Rwandans over almost a whole year period to develop this program. In 2005, the United Nations Development Fund funded it, and for the next six, seven years, Rwanda had close to six million dollars to try and get the parks, particularly the montane forest parks, gorillas, chimpanzees, rainforest tourism up and running, and to address issues with people around the, the park as well that hadn't been addressed earlier. They had been raised, but the earlier government um, had not dealt with that very well. One of the great things we got back was there was a, young, a cadre of young professional Rwandans really interested in conservation, ready to work. They were working with NGOs. Some of them then moved into the government. We had trained wardens of the two rainforest parks at the, at the bottom, Prosper and Louis, trained in biology, ecology, and uh, GIS mapping. And at the top of the park service, I think it continues to this day, it has been women running it for the last 15 years. And it's not just that that's, oh, well, that's a soft position, you know, women can run that. The head of the Supreme Court in Rwanda is a woman, the head of the Kigali police force is a woman. They have the highest percentage of women in government of any country on earth. Um, they've really made a strong effort in this area. But the key for if tourism was going to get back up and running, it was really going to have to be with gorillas as the stars and the most people weren't going to meet the head of national parks, they weren't going to meet the park warden. They were going to spend several hours, probably five or six hours, with a guide walking out to the gorillas, staying with them for an hour, and coming back. And that turned out to be a huge success. And by the end of the 90s, tourists started coming back. Uh, they were already coming before we started this program, but we were able to put in place a number of things that helped facilitate that. The rate rose considerably. You see a slight drop just a couple years ago. Um, that was when Rwanda raised the price. The price went up to $1,500 for your one day, probably a six hour experience with, with gorillas. One um, hour with the gorillas. One hour, but six hours out, back, uh, et cetera. Um, very high end experience with much lower prices for Rwandans. And in 2019, you actually had a higher, the highest number we had seen in a decade of Rwandans who were visiting the Volcanoes National Park. Not all to see gorillas, many of them were students, younger people, but again, it was building constituency for gorillas going out. But the key was foreign visitors, foreign residents, they're fine, but they didn't really spend extra money. They lived in Rwanda, they didn't rent vehicles, they didn't stay in hotels. The key was foreign visitors, that's where most of the visitation came from. It led to things like this statue that a private entrepreneur had built. Uh, if they see peace, they can bring in foreign revenue, protect them. And that was it, it's a cattle culture. Uh, I'm sorry, if you see peace, we can milk them for foreign revenue. <laughs> it's a cattle culture. That's what you do with cows, that's what we're gonna do with tourists, that's how we get money. But again, an NGO didn't do it, the government didn't do it, it was a private entrepreneur. But where does that money go? You know, if most tourists come to this town called Kennedy near the park, and then they fan out in these areas sort of shaded in green. But a lot of the park is away from that, you know, on either the east and the west. Uh, those people aren't seeing tourists, P tourists aren't buying things from them, etc. How do you get money to them? And what the current Rwandan government did, starting in 2006 or 7, with that project we were talking about, is start to take first 5% and now it's 10% of all revenues, direct revenues to the park. Um, take that and apply it to local, to the 10 villages living around the three national parks, 10 communities. 
So schools, water supplies up in the water poor northern area, the upper right, health clinics, supporting co-ops, women's basket making cooperatives, mother infant nutrition programs, all these activities are getting funded at least in part and often as a seed money to start from uh, gorilla and other part tourism revenues, but mostly gorillas. And the baskets are now an international sensation. You can buy them in many U.S. outlets. Look for Rwanda Peace Baskets, a great Christmas present. And a lot of that money, not the major share, but a lot of that money does get back to some of these women's cooperatives for a traditional art activity. You also have installations like the, some of these hotels that are very high end. Um, they charge a lot of money, but they're also now doing a bed tax. I believe this one's Sabino Hotel has a 15% bed tax plus a certain percentage of annual revenues that goes to a, a local cooperative. Now this cooperative I think is 30,000 people. Guaranteed employment and training opportunities. So some of, many of them are trying to do their part. Some have come in more recently and it doesn't seem like they're really sharing that same spirit. Um, another thing no one's really looked at, but I think somebody could do a really interesting research project on, this was the road to our, uh, our little metal hut that we lived in starting the Mountain Gorilla Project. And um, riding up that in the education vehicle or even on my dirt bike, motorcycle, pretty rough on the back. But today, and that's what many of the roads around the park look like, but today most of the roads are paved. And that pavement is allowing not just for tourists to get in, but for a lot of crops, like some of the best potatoes on earth, are getting out. And crops that mostly women are in charge of, and in charge of selling and getting revenue from that. And that's a really important development. Money's certainly gone into the overall Rwandan economy. The capital city here, Kigali, is flourishing. Lots of money coming in. The country itself this is an independent assessment uh, NGO, the Ibrahim Foundation. Rwanda leads all African countries in a number of really important categories for business, important for human welfare. They'd be ranked probably first or second in Africa overall, except for the fact, as I think Amy mentioned, it's a very authoritarian government. Um, very <coughs> much top-down control. They believe in science, that's been very helpful. They're really strong supporters of conservation, but um, particularly those who propose full democracy based on ethnic distribution, the leadership will say, you know, that didn't work last time with the genocide and we're not going down that path again. But human rights and democratic, uh, opposition political rights are not very well observed. This is an amazing thing that started over a decade ago now, I guess, probably 15 years ago. Kwiti Zina means to give a name. And in Rwandan, like other many African cultures, you wait to give a name to a newborn until they show some personality. First of all, make sure they survive. What kind of personality traits? What does grandma, what do grandma and grandpa want to want to name them? And then they have ceremonies. And Rwanda now invites people to come in and be part of the naming. All infants born in one year are then named at this ceremony, given official names at this ceremony. Amy was invited. I was invited to do this. It's a great honor. I thought I was looking pretty good in my traditional robes until Natalie Portman showed up with an off-the-shoulder look and uh, got all the attention after that. But it was amazing for us to be up on that stage, look at thousands of Rwandans and attendants, the president opening the ceremony, and thinking that right behind us in the volcanoes there were more gorillas than we could have ever imagined, and also more people paying this amount of attention to gorillas than we ever could. And the proof was there that there were more gorillas. Remarkably, after the genocide, there was a long gap without censuses, but afterwards, the first census showed it's getting up toward 400, and then 480. You know, <coughs> Schaller's estimate was 450. Pretty remarkable turnaround in the fate of the gorillas. And then the most recent census got up to 604. And that is fantastic news, but also raising a few challenges. Groups, as Amy said, the total the biggest group was 15 when we started. We're now seeing groups up to 67. Pablo, 
the young, she didn't call him this, but I would call him a juvenile delinquent. I mean, she didn't just pinch him, he liked to come up and bite people. Um, and pull by your pack and pull you down. Well, he became the head silverback of 67 gorillas with 17 females in the group. That group isn't together anymore. Um, and Pablo actually died in a fight with another gorilla defending that group. There are more conflicts between groups as the groups have gotten larger. They've occupied all those, almost all those unopened, uh, unoccupied areas Amy talked about. There are more conflicts, there's some more infanticide because of that, and this has raised some really serious questions about what do you do. The only other known population of mountain gorillas is about 40 miles away in Uganda, the windy impenetrable forest. If you made even the smallest corridor of five kilometers wide, you'd probably displace 70, 80,000 people to make a corridor, with no idea the gorillas would ever use it. Um, so there isn't a release valve here. That area to the west where it looks like the Vrungas are attached, that's a pure lots of fresh lava zone. There's no access there. And all the land in between is occupied at this kind of density. So you got an island. There is talk, there was talk just before the pandemic began of <coughs> possibly reacquiring some of those lands that were cleared for the pyrethrum program. That's now on hold. We and other conservationists have said, you know, let's think about some more creative ways to deal with this. Because again, displacing, whatever happened in the past, the idea of displacing 15, 20,000 people to do this just does not seem palatable. And the people are still there. They have built this wall to keep elephants and Cape Buffalo out, but they have lived very much in peace with the park virtually no significant poaching, none of gorillas for 15 years now. Um, but still a lot of people like Bidere, who was one of the people I surveyed back in the late 70s as a young man, who still think, you know, well, why can't we, do we really, why can't I go in the park? Why can't I get some things there? But two of his sons work with the park now. And that is the future one way or the other. I'll end with just some quick comments on, um, obviously we've all been dealing with very changed circumstances over the last year and a half, and Rwanda has taken that um, in some very tough ways. A huge drop in the number of visitors, in the revenues, uh, foreign revenue, because again, if the park gets 30 million, Rwanda estimates it makes 150 to 200 million dollars a year off indirect revenue from mountain gorilla tourism. Um, that some of that money, the direct revenue money, 3.2 million of 32 million revenue would have gone to local <coughs> communities, that's lost as well. So really severe impacts of this. On the other hand, again, Rwanda has taken real charge of what to do about the pandemic. They've had one of the lowest rates in actually not just Africa, but the world. For a while they were the only African country allowed to travel into Europe. Um, Everyone must wear a mask everywhere, outside in any urban or public setting. And tourism has restarted, but with a strong, they've, I think, lowered the group limit from eight people to six, and everyone has to wear a mask, and they've really more strictly enforced the distance between people and gorillas. About 40% of Rwanda is now, um, That comes at a later slide. Anyway, about 40% of Rwanda is now vaccinated. Rwanda is building Africa's first vaccine production facility in country. Um, they are shooting for about two thirds of the whole country vaccinated by the end of this year, and hopefully by next summer, the entire uh, adult population. So, I think that's what I was supposed to say with this slide. Overall, just if we look back again to when this all started, it's been a great success, a conservation success for the gorillas. It's extended to other parks in Rwanda, which have also had some uh, really good, uh, some really good things that happened there. The revenues are increasing in those areas, but nothing like gorillas. So the gorilla story is the engine for all this in Rwanda. But like all conservation projects, it's a work in progress. And conservation just doesn't end. There's always something new happening, some change. Um, I'll quickly end by just saying, you know, this was our starting project. 
program or experience. It remains a touchstone for us, but there are a lot of things about Rwanda that are unique and really hard to carry over to other places. First of all, the, the wildlife, gorillas themselves and chimpanzees, but also seven, more than 700 bird species um, in the country of that size. Um, leopards, lions, rhinos, elephants, zebras, giraffes, and other parks. Twenty, close to, I think, 16 primate species. You don't have that in such a small area with great roads and really good professional management like you do in other places. Um, you also, you know, Rwanda itself is the size of the Akagera Park. And again, you mentioned no, that earlier. Adirondack Park. Adirondack. Adirondack, Adirondack Park, sorry. And so scale issues really come in. You know, when the blowdown, for those of you old enough and were around in 95, when we had a derecho come through and knock down 100,000 acres of forest, that's almost exactly the size of the entire mountain gorilla habitat. Mountain gorilla habitat, the three country park, is about 2% of the Adirondacks. If 2% of the Adirondacks gets blown down, you know, life went on. We drove through that area today. It's hard to even see that anything happened. But it could take out a park as small uh, as the volcanoes, a protected area as small as the volcanoes. So scale is really important. And it means you really have to manage that, that area as a pure and protected park. You can't get into the kind of multiple use we have with these different zones in the Adirondacks, different kinds of use. And I'd say one other thing from Rwanda, you know, they have shown that you can, you know, if you take control from the top, you can establish limits, you can set up permit systems, you can use funding level, you can use price to limit access. I don't think price is going to work too well here in the Adirondacks or other U.S. parks, but permits, people are talking about. And it can be done, and it's really necessary if we're going to keep the quality up of some of these places and species that we care so much about. And again, you can't do revenue sharing like in Rwanda, but it's a great model for most a lot of other parks and countries. Uh, maybe since we don't have a gate, we don't get entry fees here. Um, but there are a lot of private establishments. Maybe the idea of some of those private establishments starting to support funding and other things that can help local communities uh, could be of help. To me, to Amy and me, the bottom line here is that what's most important from the Rwanda experience is the approach. Go, get to know a place, listen, learn. Languages are important. We got French and Swahili from Peace Corps, but when we started working out west, ranchers have a different language. Adirondackers look at the world differently. Learn that, listen, learn. Do the science as necessary, the biology, the ecology that Amy brought to the table, some of the social science that I brought, turned out to be quite important. And that there's always a need for more. But then there's also people who say, oh, we need more, we don't know enough. Get what you need, get what you can, but then act. And you know, we need action and conservation. We can't wait for the perfect situation of having all available information. And then, okay, you make some mistakes, learn from that, adapt do it differently the next time. And the last thing I'd say from our experience there is if Rwanda can do this, one of the world's poorest countries, can have such a success rate in, in conservation, um, we ought to be able to do the same and better in our more developed and better off uh, communities, nations, societies. Thank you very much.